Good morning. It's wonderful to be here and open up the scriptures together and ask God to help us as we are, by his grace, part of the family of God and care for one another. We're back in Ephesians, Ephesians 1, 18 to 20. And let me read the text from the Lexham English Bible. As I've said before, I choose the translation after doing the, all the exegetical work in the Greek language. And then I find the best translation that I believe emphasizes what uh, would bring out what I see in the Greek. But we, all, we always start with the Greek. Here's uh, that particular translation. Ephesians 1.18, the eyes of your hearts having been enlightened so that we may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance among the saints, and what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his mighty strength, which he worked in Christ raising him from the dead and seating him at his right hand in heavenly places. Now, the slide you see here is what uh, I will expound first. Ephesians 1, 18a. The eyes of your heart having been enlightened, and that is parenthetical. That's one of the things I was looking for because I think that's the best way to understand the Greek so that you may know what is the hope of his calling. So let me read the context that I preached on last week, verse 17, where it says that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. So the parentheses is uh, somewhat parenthetical to the idea of God giving us the spirit of wisdom in revelation in the knowledge of him. So that's what is being referred to. This uh, phrase, the eyes of your hearts, is not common in the Greek language, uh, and people can search for those things now. And it looks like Paul (coughs) wrote this phrase as his way of describing what was said in verse 17. So... Uh, this, the eyes of your heart is unique to this verse and there's a certain ambiguity to the grammar but I think we can get the idea Dr. Arnold says this the eyes of your heart is likely a metaphor that Paul himself created they have already received the spirit and have been sealed by the spirit so it is not a prayer that they receive the spirit that's important by the way the spirit of wisdom of verse 17 says Dr. Arnold, is probably parallel to enlighten the eyes of your hearts. And I agree, that's why I cite that. You see, as these passages that we're going to be covering as we go through Ephesians uh, come to our attention for, for us to learn what God said, I need to warn you that in church history, especially in recent American church history, people are looking for every way they can to find a higher order experience. And whether it's an a entire sanctification experience or a more pious experience or a Pentecostal experience or something, somehow they want there to be two classes of Christians, the ordinary Christians and the enlightened Christians. And so when I was a new Christian, I heard that kind of teaching some of us write from this verse and others like it. But I'm here to tell you that Paul isn't teaching Christians that they need to be higher order Christians. He's teaching Christians what is true so that they will no longer be thinking like pagans. The enlightenment, and I'm going to cite some ancient pagan texts today that were contemporary to what Paul wrote in the first century and also found in Asia Minor, 
were claiming that they needed to go through some elite or special religious process in order to avoid bad faith and to become enlightened. Paul's point is that those who are in Christ are sealed, they are safe, they do know the truth, they do have the providential work of God in their lives by grace, and they are not needing a higher order religious experience. What I like about the truth, because it's from God, and it's for our good and our benefit, is that there's nothing to sell. I can't sell you some program so that you become enlightened. Because I just told you, you already are if you're a Christian. The only thing I have that I can, and I try to do this every Sunday in one way or another, is to tell you that if you're lost and in darkness, how you can come to the light through Christ. But if you've done that, you are in Christ, which is thematic in Ephesians. The term or phrase in Christ, in him, in whom, various ways of saying the same thing, are found about 30 times just in the book of Ephesians. So it's thematic. We are already enlightened because we've gone from darkness to light through the gospel. And it would be so utterly foolish to run back to the shamans trying to find something different to enhance what God did through Christ. And we'll see that many today are still offering something that they would peddle as being higher order. Let me quote some of this right now. What did the pagans in Ephesus think about light? And if people want to know my source, Dr. Clinton Arnold's commentary is the best one that I own because he knows these sources and brings them to bear. So he says this about it, quote, the language of illumination and enlightenment, fotizo, however, says Arnold, was used extensively in the Greco-Roman religions of the day, especially with reference to the enlightenment that occurred in a mystery initiation ritual, a text that may convey an invocation associated with a ritual of initiation into the mystery of Apollo at Kleros, which was just a few days' walk from Ephesus. That was me saying that. Just north of Ephesus, reads, and I'm, he's quoting this mystery right. Quote within a quote. Hear me, O greatest God, Comes, who lights up, fotizo, the day. <clears throat> I summon you, Apollo of Kleros, unquote, within the quote. I hope this makes sense. The little thing, the little quote you'd have if you were writing. Although the readers of Ephesus, says Arnold, were familiar with local claims of spiritual enlightenment, Paul speaks of something qualitatively different. He speaks of the knowledge of the one true God based on the Lord Jesus Christ mediated by the Holy Spirit. In other words, you are sealed. You have the Holy Spirit. You've gone from darkness to light. Your sins are forgiven. You already have enlightenment. You don't need what the pagans are offering. And I've been trying to tell Christians and pastors this since the 80s. We had an article we wrote where a local Christian pastor was actually commending the pagans for having a valid worldview like this. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, you do not need what the pagans have. I don't care how much light they claim, they are walking in darkness to this very day. And they will remain in that darkness unless they repent and come to Christ. Let me give you a little preview 
of Ephesians 2 by citing verse 12. Remember that you were, let me stop right there. I'll talk about this when I get to that passage. We have the Lord's Supper today, and we do this because the Lord Jesus instituted this, and he instituted it so we would remember. And some people say, well, people already have this, and they already have that. They've already heard this. We've got to give them something new. I've heard that most of my Christian life. And I say, no, we do not. Are you telling me Jesus did not know what his own church needed? That he forgot to tell us things that we have to go glean from the pagans? Of course that's absurd. So when the Bible says to remember, it is telling us that if we remember what Christ did for us and believe his promises, that's how God sanctifies us. That's what we mean by means of grace. Why do we need to remember what the Lord did? Because we also need to remember that he's coming again. Remember the Lord's death until he comes. So while we're remembering, we're believing, and while we're believing, we're hoping, and we're hoping with great expectation. Even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. The pagans claim this, and the pagans claim that. I don't need it, and neither do you. Remember that you were, remember we were singing about that, or the music ministry did, about from the door of the orphanage to the house of the king. Remember that you were at that time separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But God gave us light in Christ. Did not Jesus himself say that he was the light of the world? Did not Jesus say that if we come to him, we would no longer be in darkness, but have the light of life? Now, the word calling there, I'll deal with this more extensively in an upcoming sermon, but in theology, there's a valid and necessary distinction. And this distinction is between the external call and the internal call. Now, this distinction is not dreamed up by people that spent too much time in a seminary library, but this is a necessary distinction based on usages in the Bible itself. So the external call is the universal call of the gospel. Jesus said, come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. The universal call goes out every time the gospel is preached. No one is excluded. Come to Christ and find light. I've so many times cited Acts twenty six eighteen. If you want to jot it down, I'm not going to turn to it today. But it was Jesus telling Paul what to preach. And it had to do with going from darkness of light to light, from the dominion of Satan to God. So that everybody has the external call who hears the gospel. But this one is about the internal call. And that is what happens when hearing the gospel, God penetrates our hardened dark, deceived heart, and we know it's true. Do you remember that? Now, you don't have to remember the day, but many of us do. Somehow, the truth got through my rebellion and my hardness, and I knew it was true. In one moment, I knew that if I refused to listen and went my way, I would go to hell and I deserved it. And I repented. If you've repented, whether even it was as a child and you didn't even remember it, that happened for you too. Paul is saying you already heard his calling, and that's why you have hope. And you don't need to go to the 
temple of Apollos and look for light from the pagans. The thing that shocks me is that the books that sell the most to Christians are offering some false experience that's not from God. And I would say this, and I don't think I'm being too melodramatic. If you are not satisfied with what God provided in Christ, you are rebelling against God and bringing dishonor to his holy name. And you be like the wilderness wanderers who said, we had it better in Egypt. Remember that story in the Bible, Numbers 14 and 15, mentioned in Hebrews as apostasy? I don't want any of this light from Christ. I want what the pagans have. We had a lot to eat. Well, who was it that cried out to Yahweh, save us from this slavery? Oh, we forgot that. Don't forget, that's why we have to remember, that God saved you, and you heard that internal call. Acts 2.39, Peter said, For the promise is for you and your children and all who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God will call to himself. That's the internal call. Now, let me show you something here that I'm calling, and I got this from a scholar on our next slide here, a crescendo of glory. That one I got from Dr. Bao, who has a great commentary too. So I want to give credit to those who have helped me learn. What this crescendo is, he calls it a tricolon crescendo, is a phrase, the hope of his calling. And then there's a parallel one that gets longer to give it more emphasis. The hope of his calling and then the riches of the glory of his inheritance among the saints, and then even a stronger crescendo that gets even longer, the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his mighty strength which he has worked in Christ. So this is a powerful crescendo of of the glory of salvation that we received as a free gift. It's a free gift. And it's more glorious than you can even know until eternity when we see it for what it is. But we believe the promises of God. Three parallel statements beginning in the Greek with tis, translated usually what is, each getting longer and more emphatic and referring us back so that we may know what is the hope of his calling. And I'm, I'm just going to be saying this today, and I didn't get this when I first studied Ephesians. I, really, it was just beyond me. I, I couldn't figure out what Paul was saying. Here's, here's what I believe is the point of saying this. And remember, Paul got this directly from Jesus Christ and didn't just get it by making up a philosophy in his mind. The truth of what God has revealed and has done needs to weigh heavily upon us so that our entire worldview, our thinking, our lives as we live them practically day by day, everything will change because of the weightiness of what God has done. I think that's the point. God wants us to know how glorious he is and how glorious his work of salvation is and what's already true for all Christians. You can be a a born-again Christian and go to church for years and hear almost nothing about any of this. I'll, I'll give you an illustration that just came this morning while I was watching the news. I better get going or I won't get to it. Let's go to 18b here, the next part of the verse. And that is the the next part of the crescendo of glory. What are the riches of the glory of his inheritance among the saints? Now, let me give you a little bit of a... uh, I'll just reveal to you why I choose a certain translation and some of these after doing the work in the Greek. 
In the Greek, you see sitting there, doxa, glory. It just stands there as, as it would have been read by the original Greek readers. And it's in the genitive, so riches of the glory is just a real literal translation of what it actually says. Now, some would say glorious wealth. See how I, I have that on my slide under the second point? If your Bible says that, it's not wrong. I'm not saying it is. You can legitimately take the genitive, riches of glory, and translate it, glorious wealth, assuming it's an attributive genitive. Oh, yeah, 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 I know. Bunch of mumbo-jumbo. The simple version is that Paul wants to emphasize doxa, glory. So I chose a translation that left it standing there saying glory. Not that it's really different, because I do believe the riches of the glory is certainly about the riches and the inheritance. And being of glory modifies that and enhances how we understand it. So the glorious wealth, if you translate it that way, is among the saints, and as we'll see later as we go through Ephesians, meaning Jewish and Gentile believers. Now it says the riches of the glory of his inheritance. Now here's that word again we saw in verses 3 through 14, the barakah, the blessing of God for his mighty deeds, glorious virtues, and wonderful promises. We saw this word, uh, kleronomia, which has the word lot within it. And I showed you back then where that came from, and it had to do with God's lot. And in the Old Testament, Israel is called God's lot. The nations are divided and put under the sons of God, but Israel is my lot. In other words, God says, you're mine. Egypt can have Egypt, but you're mine. I'm taking you from there to myself. You'll be my lot. So that in Deuteronomy. Now that same terminology from Deuteronomy and also used earlier in Ephesians 1, 5 and 1, 11, Paul is taking it and applying it to what is glorious about our relationship with Christ. That we, uh, aggregation of ragtag, hopeless sinners, because of a work of grace through Christ, are now, God, now God's lot. Isn't that amazing? Now, there's a mystery to this, and I'll be talking about that before we get through Ephesians for sure, more often. There's the secret things that belong to God and to reveal things that we can know. And we know that if we believe in Christ, we sh surely are God's lot. Now, people want to know things the Bible's not telling us, which is, well, why didn't God make every single person his lot? It's not, I don't know. The bigger mystery is, why, why am I here? Because you can't think of anybody who has much less going for them. And when Paul talks about it, remember, he talked directly with Jesus about these things. He said, well, look, at, just look at yourself. He said to the Corinthians, consider your calling. Remember that internal call? Just think about it. Not many wise, not many noble, not many, you know, great people in the world, just ordinary sinners. Now, why would he do that? Why, when in the first advent, when he chose disciples, why the ones that he had? Because he wants us to know that the power and glory belong to him and not that we had something to offer God. We need him. He didn't need us. He chose to use us despite ourselves. I hope you know that. I hope you believe that. I'm telling you, under the authority of Scripture, if you believe that, your life will change and you'll be different because you'll think different. 
it's designed really to humble us and see our dependence on Christ and the gospel. Now, this is not fatalism. Not fatalism. I told you I'm going to give you some quotes today. And so I found in my research a a citation in discussion about what the pagans in Ephesus and Asia Minor said about fate. Let me quote it to you. Quote, the first century Stoic writer Manilius advises a resignation to fate, which is determined by the movements of the astral bodies. People still do that, don't they? Continuing the quote. He notes, now we're quoting Manilius. Here's what he says. Set your minds free, mortal men. Let your cares go and deliver your lives from all this pointless fuss. Fate rules the world. Everything is bound by certain laws. Eternities are sealed by predetermined events. No one can catch fortune by praying against her or escape her if she comes close to him. Everyone, says the pagan, must bear his appointed lot. And the reason, unquote, now the reason, that was from Dr. Arnold's research, the reason I'm interested in that is the pagan uses a pointed lot using the same Greek that we have here from Paul. And that shows us, Paul knew what they were doing there. If you read Acts chapter 19 and 20, you'll see the interaction in Ephesus between the pagans and the magicians and the exorcists and the gospel. Read it. Read Acts 19 and 20 and you'll see a background. Paul knows what the pagans believed. They had already come in face to face with them when the gospel first went there. So they say, just resign yourself. Nobody can escape. Nobody can change what's going to happen. Fate rules the world. It's all determined by the astral bodies. And he said, just bear your appointed lot. That's what fatalism is. Now, I've had people tell me that the doctrine that I believe Paul teaches in Ephesians 1 is fatalism. Uh, I debated a guy who believed that, by the way. But here's the problem. Paul very much knew what the fatalists were saying, and he rebukes them and tells them the gospel. And what's the difference between the fatalists and God preordaining and so on, as we saw in Barakah. Here's the difference. We don't have to resign ourselves to anything. God is personal, omniscient, powerful, loving, and we have a relationship with him. Not meaningless fate. And we actually have a Savior who ascended to the right hand of God and has given us access to the throne of God to find mercy and grace to help in our time of need. God is personal. He's loving. He's caring. He hears our prayers. And he relates to us as beings who know and think and act. And we're never told to resign ourselves to fate. We're told to go to God with our needs and concerns. God loves us as his people. So there's the difference. And I'm not sure, but I'm going to do my best to help people study Ephesians know what the difference is. Because we don't need to create a new religion based on human ability to somehow escape fate when Paul himself is telling us how to escape fate by coming to Christ. All right, let's go to verse 19. And what is, now, remember, we want to know the hope of his calling, and we have this crescendo going on. What is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us? Now, I'm going to stop right there. 
Remember what I just cited from the pagan. Resign yourself to inevitable fate. You can't do a thing about it. What did Paul say? Is our lot determined by fate? No. Here we have a powerful, omnipotent God whose power is toward us who believe. And it's a great power. And it's according to the working of his mighty strength. Now, two different of my um, scholarly sources said the same thing. And it's very interesting for the people that really know Greek. And some, two of them said this. Paul piles up terms for power that basically exhaust all the terms available in the Greek language. As as if Paul was thinking, how many different ways can I say power? And he does it. Okay? Dunamis, energia, kratos, iskus, all modified by hyperbolo, the surpassing. So power, 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 surpassing, but it's toward us who believe. It's not a higher order experience. I used to go to the Pentecostal meetings where they said, well, if you're just a Christian, you don't have power yet. You need to come forward and get the Holy Ghost and then you'll have power. But that's not what this is saying. The fact that we, his power is great toward us is because we believe, not because we had a higher order experience that ordinary Christians haven't had or some gift that somebody else doesn't have. So this is my statement about this that I have in my notes. God is not merely a source of great power. He knows us relationally and he cares for us. This means that there is no power in the universe that can truly harm us. We are safe. Notice, hyperbolo, uh, surpassing, she used five times in the New Testament, three in Ephesians, surpassing greatness of power with various synonyms. So, these same terms were used by the pagans. And again, I have sources that know what has been uncovered, some of it even very recently, where the same terms are used, including Hooper Balo, Hooper Balon, meaning surpassing. Let me quote one. <laughs> Dr. Arnold says this. The term translated incredible, Hooper Balon, is an adjectival participle that never appears in the Greek Old Testament, but is used in a number of inscriptions from Ephesus in the magical papyri. One of those magical te- texts invokes a god with the following invocations. This is the pagans invoking a god. Quote, greatest god who exceeds all power, using that term. I call on you. So then Arnold says, people in Western Asia Minor in a context of folk belief with the familiar, with, were familiar with the rival claims of local deities to having extraordinary power. So the various gods that didn't have the attributes of deity, they're not eternal, they're not the creators, they're not omniscient, they're not omnipotent, and they're just pagan gods and deities, whatever their ontological status might have been, meaning do they really exist or not? Well, there may be some spirit claiming something or the other. But these beings are nothing if you're in Christ. They can't harm you. They can't change God's promises towards you. They can't take away your salvation. They can't harm you in any way other than what God allows for his glory and our good, like Paul's thorn in the flesh. Dear ones, you are safe. Trust God. 
Here's another magical text. This is what the magicians were saying. Quote, I conjure you, that is the angels, by the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now, this was a Jewish magical text that you obey my authority completely. So the Jewish magician, we see them also in the book of Acts, right? Remember, I adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preaches. This is like that. This shows just how literal the Bible is. This is what was going on. So here's what the, they found this. It's this Jewish text. I adjure you by the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that you obey my authority completely. Remember the guy who was trying to do that? Or the seven sons of Sceva? What happened? They got beat up and they ran naked and wounded. But this is what they did in those days. And he says this, Give me favor, power, dunamis, again, victory, strength, iscus. These are words Paul used. Before all, small men and great, as well as gladiators, soldiers, civilians, women, girls, boys, everybody, quickly, quickly, because of the power, iscus, of Sabaoth, the clothing of Eloe, and my Kratos, another word that Paul used, of Adonai. So they were saying these same things, but they didn't know God. They weren't in Christ. So there was Jewish magical texts adjuring the gods of the, of the Old Testament, not knowing the true God is revealed through Christ. And then the pagans had their version and so that was the world of Ephesus. That was Asia Minor. And into this world of magic and incantations and superstition and false belief comes the gospel of Jesus Christ. And people believed it. And they went from darkness of light and from the dominion of Satan to God. Is there any reason we need such exorcists running around today charging $3,000 to break curses? One guy emailed me, he said, I found somebody cheaper. He only charged 579 <laughs> A Christian pastor. And then he emailed back. He said, well, I went and I spent the money, but it didn't work. If you're in Christ, you're not cursed. Ephesians 1.20, which he has worked in Christ. Okay, so this is what they had. Not all this stuff they were surrounded by in the pagan world, be it pagan or Jewish sources which he has worked in Christ, raising him from the dead and seating him at his right hand in the heavenly places, using the same word we saw earlier in Ephesians 1, the word for heaven, uranos, with epi prefix, eperanos, and it could be translated the high heavens. So the pagans were looking to the highest level of the heavens where they thought they could find the name of some deity to help them. But Paul is saying by citing or by alluding to Psalm 110 verse 1 that the ascension of Christ and his royal enthronement was such that he has the greatest place of all power that they could imagine. Dunamis, Kratos, Iscus. <laughs> Pile up the terms. He has it all, and he's above all powers and authorities and beings, whether in this age or the age to come. Jesus' resurrection and ascension show the truth of these power statements. Paul's power statement in verse 19. It's very interesting to me I hope to you that Psalm 110 and verse 1 is the most often cited or alluded to Old Testament prophecy in the New. And not because it was commonly seen to be what it is, but because it was missed and the Christians proclaimed it. it it's talked about a lot in Hebrews. Paul does it here. The ascension of Christ and the enthronement of Christ should be central to our belief and our thinking about God and what he's done for us. So we do not need magic. I'm saying this in my notes here. We need faith in the promises of God about our relationship to the ascended Lord Jesus. 
It's not a small thing to have access to the throne of grace. Guess where Hebrews 4.16 said the ascended Lord went. And the right hand in the high heavens is the highest place of honor and authority. I can't emphasize too much to you that this is personal. This is personal. Many people are trying to get help, and I, I want people to get help, by the way. One famous group is, is uh, AA, but even in their own book, they keep citing something that that's, says that our situation was hopeless, no one could help us, but God would and could if he were sought. That's what they said. And, but then they turn around and say that could be anything or anybody. And I made this statement one time, well, what are the implications God would and could if he were sought? Well, here's some implications. There is a God with all power. So no situation is hopeless if we cry out to him. He would and could if he were sought. In other words, he's omniscient because he can hear the prayers of people anywhere, whoever it is that cries out to him. A local deity can't do that. They don't have the right characteristics. And that he's powerful and omniscient. So we know all these things about God. Well, guess what? People got mad. They didn't want to hear that. The doorknob is okay, I guess. I am not belittling anybody's bondage. I've been delivered from it myself. I, I, my heart goes out to you and to anyone that we know who's in bondage. But the truth is God would and could because of who he is and what he's done in Christ. And we need to know him if we're going to cry out for help. Not just some unnamed higher power. That's not enough. Dr. Arnold says this about the magical formula. formula. By contrast, Paul commends the readers a direct access to the power of God and never advocates calling on angelic intermediaries. Neither does Paul condone the use of incantations, formulas, magical symbols, the performance of certain rituals to gain access to divine power. Let me stop. I'm quoting Arnold. I get emails constantly from people saying, how do I pray? And thank God we have new Christians that are coming to Christ through critical issues commentary. They read the article and they come to Christ and then they want to learn how to be a Christian. Praise God. But they have a hard time believing that all this stuff that Roman Catholicism had dumped on them and everybody else is false. In other words, if you fast for so many days, if you uh, deprive yourself, if you go into the wilderness and in solitude, if this, if that, if that, how long, how much, what do I got to do? How many times do I have to pound my head against the wall? How many things do I have to say? How can I pray so God will hear me? And dear ones, they are thinking like pagans. Do you really believe, based on what we just learned from Paul in Ephesians, about the ascended Lord who loves us and cares for us and saved us and delivered us and brought us true enlightenment, that if we don't know very well other than, here's my problem, dear Jesus, help me, I, I pray, help me, Lord, in the name of your son, Jesus, help me. I need help. I can't do this myself, but I know you love me. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. And that's all you can come up with, that God's going to say, well, why didn't you say 10 Hail, Hail Marys as so many our fathers? And why didn't you give all your money away? And why didn't you go deprive yourself? And why didn't you do this? And why didn't you do that? And I see people going into those churches. My heart goes out to them because they're going in there to be lied to and abused and taken advantage of and told lies and they'll never know God. That's not the God of the Bible who requires all this stuff. Jesus Christ 
is the Lord of glory and he died for us and he hears us. That's it. That's it. Our God is not going to say to the Christian, you didn't say the magical words right, so I won't hear you. It's so hard to get that thinking out of people's minds. Uh, back to Arnold, formulas, symbols, rituals. Here's what Arnold says. He simply prays for their increased awareness of God's power already available to these believers. I'm going to have to continue on here so I can get to the applications. But if I'm going to spend too much time, I'd rather do it in the text at hand. But let me read to you Psalm 110, 1 and 2, so you know what it says. The Lord says to my Lord. By the way, Jesus mentioned that. Well, who's the Lord who said to my Lord? Who is he talking about there? Well, we don't know. Well, he was talking about the Christ, the Lord. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. The Lord will sit at my right hand. That's where he ascended to. The Lord will stretch forth your strong scepter of Zion, say, rule in the midst of your enemies. They're saying, where is the kingdom? Where is Messiah ruling? At the right hand of God in the midst of his enemies. We have access to that throne of grace. Conversion, let me give you some applications. Conversion is going from darkness to light. God cares about us. Fate does not. Every time I see people buying lottery tickets, I always think of that. I think of that Greek text. Agathe, uh, what was the luck again? I remember, I'm forgetting the word for luck. But it, there's, there's a goddess named Good Luck that they adjured. 2K, I think. Agathe 2K. Dear goddess, good luck. Shine down on me. By the, by the pull tab. Scratch the ticket. No, 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 no. Don't do that. The state is just taxing the poor. That, well, that's a political statement. Here's what you do. You go to Christ and ask him to take care of you. Let's go from darkness to light and see what that means from Hebrews 10, 32 and 33. But remember the former days when after being enlightened, you endured a great conflict of sufferings, partly by being made a public spectacle through reproaches and tribulations, and partly by becoming shares of those who were so treated. So the Hebrew Christians had been converted, and the term there is the same in the Greek, being enlightened. That's the same thing Paul said. And when that happened, they went into a conflict. How many of you, when you were converted, suddenly had conflicts? Family conflicts, religious conflicts, co-worker conflicts. Sometimes it's not exactly like that, but it's more common than not. We still are conflicted because we live here and we're not of here. Those in darkness hate the light and hate those who walk in it. It says in Hebrews 6, 4, we were once for all enlightened. We don't need a new experience. There's a pattern in Hebrews and I commend our radio shows on Hebrews that are on CICMinistry.org. I had uh, coffee with Dick Cuffle, who was with me when we did that, and thanked him for the hard work that contributed to the radio. And uh, I think we can listen to that and feel really good that we're learning Hebrews. And it's very comforting, okay? Uh, So that's why it's still out there. I believe it's accurate material, and we need to learn Hebrews. And I'm not saying anything about anything in the past. I'm just saying right now, I want to learn Hebrews, and I'm thankful for those that helped me do it. But uh, notice it says they had a past experience. Hebrews 10.34 shows sympathy to prisoners. Warning, don't throw away your confidence. Comfort, you have need of endurance so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. Notice that? Warning. 
He'll remember what happened, warning and comfort. Dear ones, we've been through a lot. I don't belittle any of that. And whatever your story is, you've been through a lot. Everybody has. We have sick family members that we can't do much about. I just think someone today, my mom, I don't know what's going to happen to her. She's in a horrible condition. But some of you, someone knitted a shawl and another one brought it to her. When I last talked to my mom, she said, tell them this was a lifesaver as she kept the shawl over her in her coldness and shaking in the cold. Doing, showing sympathy doesn't require being some martyr. It means showing care and concern for people that we know in the family of God. Every one of you is going through something and you've got, as relatives get older, we lose loved ones and we have sicknesses and so forth. And when my mom told me that, I, uh, I got to admit, it brought some tears to my eyes to think that the family of God cares about my mother. And thank you. Showed sympathy to people suffering. I've got to quickly cover this now. 1 Peter 5, 7. This is so simple. This is what I tell everybody. I need to write an article about this. I was going to do that six months ago, but then the ice melted and the fish started biting. But uh, to be totally honest with you, my daughter knows that's what's happened. I can't help it. They keep biting. 1 Peter 5, 7. Casting all your cares on him because he cares for you. Can you think of anything more simple than that? And in, it's pretty cool in the Greek too, but the, the word for casting here would be, it's used elsewhere for like throwing a blanket over a donkey. So take all of the worries and fears and cares and things you can't fix and things you can't do anything about it. Take it all and just cast it on him. You could translate this anxiety accurately, but I like cares because it creates this wordplay. Because he does care for you. Pantheism, fatalism, they're not personal. They don't care about you. So many are panentheists. They believe God is in everything. Panentheism doesn't help you because the universe and Mother Nature, I've told everybody, nature's not your mother. But Mother Nature isn't going to solve your problems. You need Christ. Throw it on him. He's at the right hand of God. The world hates us. God cares for us. By the way, that word cast is found in Psalm 55, 22. You can look that up. I got to get to this because it's pertinent. I only have a few minutes. I'm going to read verses 12 and 13 of Philippians. I just saw something this morning on the news. I got to tell you about it. Philippians 2, 12. So then, my dear friends, just as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now even more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. See, the gospel is a sanctifying thing, and it motivates us to be in awe of God. That's what that means. The fear and trembling means be in awe of God. Work out is an imperative in the Greek. Now I got to get to this one. Verse 13, for it is God who is working in you, enabling you, enabling you, both to desire and to work out his good eudokia. You know that word from Ephesians 1, good purpose. So uh, work out your salvation with fear is trembling because God is working in you. The reason for being in awe of God is because he is working in us, sinners saved by grace. The awesome God made us his children. He will accomplish his good pleasure for the, his glory by changing us. Now, I wrote this down this morning. I'm watching a, a, a news channel that has also has opinion. They brought a pastor on who was selling his new book. And I wrote this down because he on national TV said the exact opposite 
of what Paul said. I had this sermon already to preach, and here comes this pastor by the name S-O-N-K-S-E-N, Sankson, it's the pastor. Here's what he said, and this is a direct quote. If you go all in, God will go all out. It's the opposite. In other words, God is sitting in the sideline, and he's not going to do anything for you because you didn't go all in. He's waiting for us to show we, we're uh, serious enough or we're going to work hard. This is so American. It is. It's American. It goes all the way back to Finney. Human ability. Do more. Try harder. Go all out. Serve. Get in there. And do all this. And if you do that, then God will come along and help you. No! False. You decide. Is that guy on TV right or is Paul? Paul. We go all out because he's working in us, giving us even a desire to do the right thing. If we didn't have God in us, we wouldn't even want to do what was right, much less having the power to do it. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for showing kindness to those who are in darkness and showering us with hope, salvation, freedom, access to the throne of grace. And may we give you the glory and know that we can just come to you in our time of need, and that you're going to change us because you're kind and compassionate. Thank you for sending your son, in whose name we pray, Jesus Christ's name, amen.